I'm, uh, I'm hoping today, I, by the grace of the Lord, somehow I will wrap up this series called The Storms of Our Lives. You know, and I titled this sermon, Turn Around. You know, we need to learn how to turn around. Amen. <laughs> We literally need to learn to, how to turn around. I was sharing on Tuesday night there, you know, and I encourage you guys to come Tuesday nights because, you know what, sometimes you hear stuff on Sunday and then you're like kind of lost. Where is this coming from? Because Tuesday nights we're sharing stuff that, you know, if we continue from Tuesday night and then Sundays we continue on Tuesday night. So it's just interconnected. So if you are at home and you're not doing anything or you're, you're free, please be here on Tuesday nights. Be here part of the fellowship. God will bless you. God will speak to you. God will move uh, in a mighty way. And, you know, and we are, we are timely. Amen? We are timely. We, we, we finish at 9. I finish at 9.01. You know, I said that. I said I'll be done at 9, but it was 9.01. One minute late. But God was good. You know, God says, okay, I give you that one minute grace. Because, you know, but, but we, are, we are here about God's kingdom. Amen? And, and we're going to continue doing that. And I was sharing on Tuesday night regarding how we need to take our eyes off the enemy and put our eyes on God. And how we need to stop looking at how, what the enemy is doing and we should see what God is doing. The whole story about David and Goliath, everybody saw what David Goliath was doing to Israel, but we didn't sit now that see how God was setting up David to come into the kingdom and take his position as a king. Because it requires a king to go before the army to fight the enemy. <laughs> Because those days, the king was the forerunner. Those days, the king wasn't like the president and prime ministers today sitting in the Oval Office or back somewhere and make orders and command things to happen. They actually went before the army. They were the head of the army. They, made, they put their life as much in danger that the whole army put in their danger. And when the king was dead, then the, the whole country was, you know, the, the, that whole kingdom fell apart. But the king was the champion. Amen. The king was the champion of the tribe. The king was the champion. That's why the champion went before them. And, and this is what, they, you know, and we see that David was coming to his kingship, and he needed to become the forerunner, and God had to make a way for the Israel to see that God has anointed him as a king. And uh, my brothers, my sisters, please understand, it was only the the. The brothers and Jesse and his family that knew that David was anointed to become a king. So God had to do something publicly for the rest of Israel to see what God is, what, who God has anointed. It was a shifting. It was a, it was a, it was a paradigm shift in, in the whole history of Israel that they saw that the king is afraid of this giant, but there is a shepherd boy that is a king that is not afraid of anything. So many times we look at the, what the enemy is doing and we're missing that God is using the enemy for opportunity to do his greatness and is moving in his greatness. And God allows the enemy to do things because the enemy, if he knew what he was doing, he wouldn't do it. The Bible tells us if the enemy knew, if the principalities and authorities of this world knew what would happen if they crucified Christ Jesus, they would have never done it. Because... By doing that, they give him access to hell for him to take back the key from hell and bring it back. And that's why the, the Bible says the enemy is just a tool in God's hand. He allows him to do things to fulfill his promises, to bring us to our destinies, to bring us to his glory and do all these things. And I want to continue ministering on this subject, turn around. We need to learn how to turn around and we need to go, you know, we can go to the book of Samuel chapter uh, the, gospel, uh, the book of Samuel and chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm not going to read everything. I'm going to reference to some parts of it. I know you guys all know the story, but I'm going to just refer to some part of it that we need to, to, to read together because uh, I think it's good for us to have reference before us, but uh, the study is mostly for yourself. The book of Samuel, the first, uh, the first Samuel or Samuel 1, whatever they call it, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel. I'm confused. Uh, you know, English is, you know, English is a divided language, but yet common. Some call, some call it 1 Samuel, some call it 1 Samuel, you know, and then I get confused. I said, I did not know there were 2 Samuels, and then they said, no, the British says 1 Samuel, you know, and then the, the North American says 1 Samuel, you know. Uh, whatever way be it is, it's 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, uh, you know, it, it all makes sense somehow, right? Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and um, 
I know I'm not going to, as I said, I'm not going to read through it. I'm just going to refer to some part of it for us to, to understand the, t- the, the message that the Lord wants to share with us this morning. And here's the thing, my brothers, my sisters. You need to understand that the enemy of your soul has been already defeated on the cross of Calvary. You are more than overcomers. You are more than conquerors. And you need to understand that you need to turn around from things in your life that doesn't make sense. Amen? Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for your Holy Spirit ministry, O Lord God. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are among us and you're moving in us and through us. We thank you, O Lord God, that you are all-knowing and you're well able to do all things beyond our imaginations, O Lord God. And we are here just a tool in your hand, O Lord God. We are an offering, O Lord God. We are the little offering in your hand that you can multiply and do greater works, O Lord God. As the gospel tells us that our life is a living sacrifice sacrifice, which is our reasonable service unto you, Lord God. And Lord, we are, we are just like that, that, that fish and the bread, that, that, that we're just so little, but yet, oh Lord God, you can break us and feed, oh Lord God, a multitude, thousandfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, Lord God, we can do mightily. And we come here this morning, we say, Lord, that's all we are, oh Lord God. We are just in your hands, oh Lord God, that you can do what you desire to do. And we ask you, oh Lord God, that you lead us, direct us. Teach us, O Lord God, by the mighty power of your name, O Lord Jesus, we pray. Minister through your Holy Ghost to us this morning as I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. The Bible tells us in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 that that Philistine start gathering themselves around and and were coming down against uh, uh, Israel and they were standing there and there was a champion that went out, out of the camp a Philistine named Goliath of Goth, whose height was six cubits, the span of most ten feet. Just think about it. Ten feet tall. Basketball player and greater, okay? He's ten feet tall. And he had bronze helmet, his head, and wore a coat of mail, and the coat weighted 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze shiner armors on his legs and bronze, uh, bronze across his shoulder. And the shaft of his spear was like the waver beam. His spear had weight of 600 shekel of iron and the shield bear went before him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come to draw up a battle? I am not a Philistine. And are you not the servant of Saul? Interesting question. Very interesting question. He says, I'm not a Philistine. He says, I'm not one of those, I'm not one of them. But aren't you the servant of Saul? He didn't ask them, Are you the servant of the Lord? I know for many years. I've been reading this text, we've been reading this text, and we, we didn't look at it that way. But he never said, aren't you the servant of the Lord? Because they didn't, he didn't see the Lord upon them. He saw Saul upon them. Because who leads you, you will get the characteristic of that person. You will function like that person functions because the leader will impute their anointing or this anointing upon you. That's why it is important, as I shared last week, be careful who you give your ear onto because they can influence you either direction. That's what happens. And it is, it is the fact that Saul, this Goliath, he's a champion. And we read down, the, the, down in the words very soon that he wasn't just any champion, but he was the champion of gods. Because when David comes to him, they tell him, the, the Philistine starts cursing him in the name of their gods. So he wasn't just any champion. He was serving multiple gods. He says, I'm not in the Philistine. I'm not one of them, but I'm a champion of God. He showed up. And just think about it. it I mean, I'm reading the scripture. This man is a heavyweight. He is not a lightweight. He's not a featherweight. He's a heavyweight. 
He's, he's coming as a champion of a heavyweight. He's wearing this bronze and he's wearing all this weight upon him. You cannot be a small guy. You cannot be the size of, you know, Joshua and go there with all those, uh, all those clothing that you have on. Joshua, if I put those clothing on Joshua, man, Joshua would be like, pfft, as strong as he is. He would, have, pfft, he would be crushed under those all, all that helmet and all that things that he has. He was, he was a mighty man. He was a heavy champion. Heavyweight, he's there. And he's taunting them. He's saying, I thought that your king is a champion too. That's what he really saying. Aren't you man of Saul? He's not looking for them. He's looking for a champion. He's not looking for his warriors. He's looking for a champion. He says, where is your champion? Bring me a champion. And if you understand anything about boxing and sports and all these things, I love sports. I love these kind of things because it makes sense to me. Sports speaks to me about God. I don't watch sports because, you know, I just want to waste my time. Sports speaks to me God somehow. And everything makes sense to me. It might not make sense to you. That's okay. But I'm just telling you why, why I love to watch sports because I see life in sports. It used to be not that way. But God changed my perspective about it. Because some, I used to be emotional. I used to get angry and happy based on sports winning. But now I see sports as a part of life. I see there is winning, there is losing, there is mindsets, there is all sorts of things. But in boxing, we have many champions. We have heavyweight champions. We have a lightweight champion. We have a featherweight champion. We have a midweight champion. And there is no way in the world the heavyweight champion goes and fights a lightweight champion. He will never go fight a featherweight champion. He will crush that champion with a couple punches and it's over. And when he wins, nobody will consider him to be a winner or a champion because he beat somebody that was beneath him. And here's Goliath. He saying, I'm not looking for anybody to fight because if I fight anybody, I'm just going to belittle myself. I'm looking for somebody that is champion that can fight me, who is a heavyweight champion who can come against me and be heavyweight pound by pound, round by round, be able to fight me the way I can fight it. Where is that person? Why aren't you, aren't you followers of Saul? Don't you have a champion amongst yourself? Where is your king? Why don't you bring your king on? Why isn't he here with standing before me? And I want to minister to you this morning that God is looking for some heavyweight champions this morning. He's looking for some heavyweight champions. People who have been working out in the gym of the Holy Ghost. They've been building themselves up. They've been taking some protein shakes and then building some muscle in the presence of God. And they keep on pressing on and ironing, pumping iron. And they're going to the Holy Ghost and they're saying, fill me God. Put more energy in me. Make me bigger, oh Lord God. Because I am not fighting a, champ, a, a fight among against some featherweight or lightweight. I'm fighting a fight against a heavyweight. Because the devil, he's a heavyweight. And God is looking for some people that know how to fight in a heavyweight round. And now I'm going to tell you something. Because if you're a heavyweight fighter in the kingdom of God, you do not go to the battlefield. Because your battlefield is in high places. Your ring is in high places. You don't fight amongst people. Because when you understand that, Goliath understood that. I don't fight flesh and blood. I'm fine. I'm not going to fight a bunch of people who do not know what, they, what is going on. I know where my ring is. My ring is in high places. My ring is in a place that I need to have an audience of the angels. An audience of, 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 of demons to come and see the champion of the champions is winning. And Christ Jesus is the champion. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the everlasting Father. He's the one that is living in us. And he's the champion of champions. And he has not yet backed down from one fight. He has not backed down from one fight yet. And he lives in us. And he lives through us. And he wants us to do battles for him. But here it is. He's looking at all of these things. And, uh, and they're talking to him. And, saw, and he's talking, asking them, aren't you Saul's uh, man? And then here comes little boy David. David, he hears from his father, Jesse. And then Jesse tells him, hey, listen, I want you to go and take some food. 
I want you to take some food, some lunch for your uh, for the elder for the elders for the uh, for the your brothers. And David listened to his father, and he left the sheep back in Bethlehem, and then he came to them in the morning. And as he went to the brothers, and he was going there, he heard the noise. He heard the noise that they were saying that there is this champion of Philistine. There is this champion that is coming taunting the people of God. And the Bible tells us that he left his belonging with the servant, with the one that was carrying with him. And he ran into the battlefield. He ran towards the highway. He didn't back down. He didn't look at him and say, oh, I'm just a lunch boy. He knows he's been anointed to be the king. He knows that he is the king. He knows that God had called him to be the king over Israel. And when he heard, he didn't become like Saul, frightened, sitting back somewhere and wondering who will fight his battle. No, he ran into the battlefield because he knew that a king has to find, fight his battle. And he has to lead his people. And he has to deliver his people. He ran into the battlefield. He ran towards them. And he looked at them. He says, what's going on, folks? They said, didn't you hear what he's saying? This uncircumcised champion of Philistine. He says, I heard. But I also heard something else. What shall it be done to the man that kills this Philistine? And then the man told him, that shall be that to a man who kills him, he should receive, be enriched, get rich, get riches, and will give him a daughter to make a father and make his he make his father's house tax free in Israel. And David was listening to all of this. Says, "All right, this is good. This is good. I like that." And the people answered him after this manner, saying, "So shall it be done to that man that killed him." And then comes here. Eli, Eli, Eliab, Eliab, the eldest brother, the son of Jesse, he comes. The one that Samuel came in front, the oldest son, handsome, tall, strong warrior. And Samuel looked at him, was going to anoint him. He said, uh-uh, not him. He doesn't have my heart. He doesn't have my heart. I don't want to anoint him. He is kind of like Saul. And we will see today why he was like Saul. We understand why he was like behaving like Saul. Because Eliab and all his brothers, they still hated the David. They didn't still like him because David was from another mother. David was conceived out of iniquity. And, and he was a shame of the family. And nobody wanted to really know him. But God chose him. And God had anointed him. And here's the reality. God will choose and anoint people that we least expect to be anointed and be chosen by God. The very people that we don't want them to be anointed by God, God will choose. The very people that we feel is the outcast of our society, God will choose. God will choose the very people that man writes off because God is himself, Jesus himself, knows exactly what it means to be written off. Because the Bible says that he was the stone that the builders have rejected. God uses a lot of rejected, rejected people because God knows that the rejected people have a heart to cry before the presence of the Lord and they know how to find the presence of the Lord because they have only one hope and the hope is in Christ. Christ, our hope of glory that lives in us and through us and moves through us. And here comes Eliab and he, the oldest brother and speaks unto the man. Eliab was angry with, with Kindle against David. And he said... Why comest thou down here? And with whom have you left those few ships in the wilderness? I know your pride and your nuttiness of thine heart. Thou art come down in the midst to see the battle. What an accusation by his brother who knows that he is his king. His future king has come in here, and he looks at him. He says, why did you come here? Who did you leave the sheep with? You are prideful. You are naughty. You don't care about nothing. All you care is about yourself, and that's why you have come here, and you left everything, the few sheep that is left in the wilderness, because your presumption 
evilness of your heart, you have come down here, you might see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it now a harmless question? Obviously, it tells us that this man, his brother, his older brother, was constantly chastising him. He says, what now? What have I done now? Everything I do is wrong. Everywhere I go is wrong. I breathe, I'm wrong. I don't breathe, I'm wrong. I sleep, I'm wrong. I get up, I'm wrong. I go this direction, I'm wrong. I don't go that direction, I'm wrong. What else have I done? I should not just move. I should say, what have I done wrong? I'm just following my father's order to bring you guys lunch. And I heard that this is what's happening. I just want to know what's going on. I've not done I didn't leave the sheep by themselves. The, our father told us to leave the sheep. What have I done now wrong? I don't know. I don't know if you have experienced that. I don't know if you have experienced that ever in your life that you just do not know what to do. Whatever you do is wrong. You, you say this is wrong. You say that is wrong. You pre preach righteousness, you're wrong. You, do, you preach hope, you're wrong. You preach sin is wrong. You preach that is wrong. Everything you say is wrong. You cannot come any, with any word that is out of your mouth that is right. And everybody questions your motive. Everybody comes against your motive. And everybody says, well, oh, they have to have a plan. Or they hate me, or they don't like me, or whatever be the case. You don't, I do not know if you ever face those kind of situations in your life, that whenever whatever you do is just wrong and wrong and wrong in the sight of man. And David looks at his brother and says, come on, man. But the best part is, is here. Here's the kicker. David says, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm done with this. My haters. I'm done with those people who don't like me. I'm done with everybody that wants to chastise me. I don't care what you have to say. Elabai, that's it. I'm done with you. I'm finished. It is no longer. I'm going to deal with you. And he goes in verse 30. He says, and David turned away from Elabai. Hallelujah. He turned away. He turned away from me, Elabai. He looked away from him. He says, I'm done with you. I don't need to mess with you any longer. He turned away to another, and he asked the same question. And again, the man gave him the same answer. My brothers, my sisters, my, the subject that I'm preaching to you this morning is, if you're going to be a champion for God's kingdom, you need to learn how to turn away from haters. You need to turn away from the naysayers. You need to turn away from people who are throwing stones in your way. You need to turn away people who are questioning you. You need to turn away from everything that is coming against the will of God. You have been anointed and chosen by God for such a time as this. And it's not up for them to understand what you're doing. It's up for God to know what you're doing. God will make sure that everything around your life will come down and become basically nothing. But God will choose you to do what is faithful before Him. And you need to stop talking to people who are constantly hating on you and talking bad about you and chastising you and questioning you and talking evil about you. You need to continue, stop, and you need to turn around from them. And some of you need to turn away from people who are talking bad about other people because you've been listening to people gossip for too long. You've been listening to the lies for too long. You've been listening to the pain, pity, painful behaviors for too long. And God says, turn away from them. Stop listening to them because all they're doing is they're lying to you. All they're doing is they're accusing other people. All they're doing is they're trying to make themselves higher and making, while they're making other people lower because David was faithful to his father. All he was doing was bringing lunch as his father called him to bring it. He didn't he wasn't evil. He wasn't prideful. He didn't come with the spirit of pride to do anything. But here comes his brother. Says, oh, you're prideful and you're evil. And all the other men in Israel could have listened to Eli Eliab. And they could have said, oh yeah, his brother called him evil. Then he must be very right. But you know what happened? None of the men of Israel gave an ear to what his brother said. Folks, it's not your enemy out there that is against you. It's your brother that is in the house that is against you. It's not your enemy out there that is against you. It's your brother that's in the house that is against you. It's the very people of God that are against God's people. It's the very people that's supposed to be humble for the sins of their heart 
are against you. The very people that are supposed to turn away from their sins and repent of their sins that are against you. The very people that are not repentful that are against you. They don't want to repent of their sins. Therefore, they become prideful and they misuse the scripture and the Bible to come against you. I know you haven't experienced that. That's all right. Maybe you will experience it down the road. But the very people that are ungrateful for what the Lord has done in their life, they are against you. And they will find people that will listen to them. They will find people that will hate them with you. They will come bring an army of people to fight you, but then they don't dare to come to your face to fight you. I post something a few weeks ago on my Facebook. I know some of you have seen it somewhere. This preacher was saying, it says, you know, you know you are powerful when people who hate you go find a bunch of people that hate you as well and then they join them and then they don't dare to attack you themselves. They don't show up. If you have something right to tell me and you want to attack me, why don't you show up and let's go pound by pound. Let's go be face by face. Let's go in the match together, right? My brother Brad, you know, if you have some strength, show up, man. Don't just tell me that you have techniques in Taekwondo. You do Taekwondo, right? What do you do? Jiu-jitsu, Jiu -Jitsu, sorry, Jiu-jitsu, the wrong sport. Jiu-jitsu, don't tell me I'm a Jiu-jitsu master and don't show up in the ring with me. If you're Jiu-jitsu master, let's go pound for pound. Let's show up and go, go into this fight together. But don't go and tell people, oh, Brad is nothing. Oh, look at him. He's too skinny. I can take him out. Oh, he, he doesn't know anything about Jiu-jitsu. He doesn't understand Jiu-jitsu at all. What does he know about Jiu-jitsu? He doesn't know anything. If he knew something, then he should be over here and over there. I studied Jiu-jitsu. Uh, if you did, just show up then. Just show up. Why don't you just show up? But this is, a, this is a thing that happens in the kingdom of God. People who are unrepentful of their sin, they always will find people that will want to take down people of God that are moving in the presence of God. That's always they do. And they, the spirit is not out there. The spirit is in there. And I have a backup for that scripture, by the way. Because... It wasn't the Roman soldier that betrayed Jesus. It was Judas, who Jesus gave him the Holy Spirit. By the way, people say, oh, Judas didn't have those souls. Oh, yeah, he had Holy Spirit. Jesus blew the Holy Spirit upon Judas, and Judas did also miracles and signs and wonders and all of it. It was the very person that Jesus was ministering to that betrayed Jesus. Sold him out. For shekels, sold him out for the wealth of this law, money, sold him out for everything that was out there. And when Jesus shows up to Peter, he asks him, do you love me more than these things? He didn't ask him, do you love me more than your brothers and sisters? He says, do you love me more than your fishnet? Do you love me more than your job? Do you love me more than your boat? Do you love me more than these things? Do you love me more than this world? If you really love me more than this world, then feed my sheep. He wasn't talking about his brothers and sisters. He wasn't talking about his fellow fishermen. Do you love me more than these things? He was talking about his worldly positions. And people sell out people because they are unrepentful. Peter rejected Jesus. So did Judas. But Peter repented and he became the man that stood on the day of Pentecost and declared that that's what you have heard, that the Lord says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and, uh, all, and your sons and your daughters shall see visions and, and they shall prophesy and your old man shall see dream dreams. He started because he chose to repent of his ways. But Judas didn't repent. Judas tried to get rid of this worldly position that he got, that he sold Jesus for it. But he couldn't, he didn't have the heart to repent. And then he went for the kill. He killed himself. My brothers, my sisters, I'm telling you, the heart of an unrepentant person is a suicidal spirit. A person that does not repent eventually commits a spiritual suicide. That is the most dangerous thing that can happen to any human being. Because a spiritual suicide, once it happens, you don't even know that you're dead. You don't even know you're dead. 
Saul was dead. Saul didn't repent when Samuel showed up to him. Saul wasn't able to see that he's already dead in his spiritual walk because he didn't, Samuel came to him and said, I gave you so many chances to repent of your ways and you don't repent at all and you're making excuses. Saul was a prime example of some Christians today. Oh, I'm just doing this for God. I didn't ask you to do this for God. I didn't ask you to do it. But you have to understand, I love God. Samuel, don't you get it? I really love God. I don't get it because you aren't repentful. You are living in sin and you are not repenting of your sin. God has removed his anointing from you. Yes, you might build some victories. Yes, you might go to some battlefields and win it. But it doesn't mean that you're alive. You're dead as dead mouse can be. You are dead. And the worst thing is, for somebody is spiritually dead, and they do not know they are spiritually dead. But it showcased to us, in Samuel chapter 17, it showcased to us when the champion of Philistine comes and says, where is your champion? Where is your king? Because the word king and champion, by the way, goes hand in hand, just in case you did not know. The word king and champion is synonymous as the same word. Where is your champion? Show me your champion. I want to fight your champion. Aren't you man of Saul? Saul couldn't touch at all the giant. You know why? Because he was spiritually dead. He was dead in his uh, transpasses. The Bible tells us that he was so dead that every time evil spirit would come upon him, and he had to do what? Meditation. And who was giving him the meditation? David. David had to play the harp because he carried the anointing. And the anointing was setting him free. But without it, he couldn't do it. I'm telling you, sinful Christians, I know this for a fact. If you don't know that is, you want you can test this, what I'm telling you. Sinful Christians... The first thing that they do before they fall completely out of God's way, they will do meditation that is worldly. They will do yoga. They will do read other books. They will go into Buddhism. They will go to Hinduism. I'm telling you straightforward. They get into all spirituality because these demons are tormenting them because they are unrepentful. And for a season, there are people that are around them, like David, that are worshiping God. They will deliver them from these spirits. But eventually, like Saul, they will fall into the demise of their own death. You can take this to the bank and cash it. I know these days you don't cash checks any longer. You just take a screenshot of it on your phone. But you, as, if you're as old as I am, they say, this check is as, you know, you can take this check to the bank and cash it. Because back in my days, they would give you, you know, checks that was not, you know, honorable. You know, people would deposit the check, and then the check would bounce, and then you had to chase that person, and the person might have gone away. But they would, th- this thing that comes, this, this word, that this slang, or this idiom that comes from, says you can take this check to the bank, and you can cash it. It means it is the truth. There's value in this. You can take this and see. People who go into other spirituality, they are going to die because they're unrepentful of their sins. The very first thing that they will do, they will find every other source. They will bring every every single compromise in their personal life. And they will judge everybody else except themselves. David didn't excuse himself of his sin. Saul did. But I did this for God. But I love God. That I want this for God. But I want that for God. Folks, the meditation of your heart should set you free. Not the meditation of other people should set you free. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says we should meditate upon the Word of God day and night. We should be in the Word of God day and night. We should be with Him all the time. We should be preaching. We should be ministering, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us all day long. We should allow this, all these things to happen to our life. And here's Saul that is unrepentful. And here comes this giant that is standing up. And God says, this is not to just showcase David's entrance into the kingdom. This is also to show Israel that I am no longer with Saul. 
Because the Bible tells us that Saul's man couldn't call, kill no giants. But David's man, when he became a king, they killed giants. Giant killers raise up giant killers. Champions raise up champions. Heavyweights raise up heavyweights. People who are doing the work of the kingdom of God will raise up mighty men of God. I know it requires some time to get there. I know it requires some time to get to the places that we need to be. Like Sister Hannah was telling us this morning, it will take time. It takes some battles. It will, you have to go through some wars. You have to cry all things by yourself. But it requires for us to get there. No fighter ever goes in a fight without being ready. They go into a fight, and I love boxing for this reason, because when they go, they build endurance first. They don't just build muscles. They build endurance. They will build stamina, because round by round, pound by pound, you have to be able to take it. If you have never been to a boxing club, please go. I've been to one, and I tell you, it's one thing to work out in a gym. It's another thing going to a boxing, man, a boxing gym. It takes your breath out of you. It takes you, start punching those punching bags. I'm telling you, you come out, <gasps> you think you have been smoking 50 years of your life, your lungs starts opening up, everything starts moving in a different shapes and every direction. It's a totally different world that you're going into. The champion, and we need to understand that we need to go into the gym of the Holy Ghost, and we need to go and train in the Holy Ghost so much that we can face, when we go into the ring, we can face the enemy with the power of the Holy Ghost. And the funny thing is about this whole thing, when a, when a boxer goes into training, he doesn't just train by himself. He has one that is conditioning him. He has one that strengthens him. There's one that, that will tell him what to eat. There's another one that tells him what to do. God says, we are the body of Christ. We have all the Holy Ghost. We need one another. We need to strengthen each other. We need to build each other to become champions of champions. We need to walk this championship walk. We need to testify of the goodness and the mercies of God. We need to tell each other the battles that we have won with the Lord. We have to tell people what God has given us in victories. We need to be able to testify of the goodness of God in all those ways. Because when David starts talking about let me take care of this uncircumcised Philistine, the news got to the ears of Saul. Bring him to me. And it says, he looked at him and says, little boy, okay, let me go to another boy. Let me go to Joshua. Because Joshua is so, man, I, I, he's going to get baptized in a couple of weeks. But you know what? Come, Joshua, come, just, just, just come. I, I was telling his brother yesterday, I said, man, I'm scared to see Joshua in the, when he's getting baptized, you know. I said, once he takes his shirt off, he's ripped like he has eight packs, you know. I said, you know, he's, he's strong. Don't look at him small. He's like very strong, man. He can do crazy stuff. He's like, you know. Right, right here is rock, man. <laughs> you know? It's all rock, solid rock, you know. And he's so... He's David, and Saul looks at this. Hey, little boy, <laughs> do you know who that guy is? He is a heavyweight, and look at you. You're just a little boy. You cannot take up on him. You said, yeah. <laughs> you're David. You're, you're not Joshua right now. You're David. <laughs> okay. I'm not saying, no, he was, uh, David was about 19 at that time. You're getting there. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very scared. I'm scared, of, I'm scared of some of the young people in our church, man. I'm telling you. By the time they go out 2021, 20, they're going to be some beast, man. They're going to be like taller than me, stronger than me, man. They're going to bench press me after a while, you know. <laughs> they don't go to the gym. They're like, Pastor, come here. Let me lift you up. <laughs> That's not what they will do, you know. But anyways, and this song says, hey, boy, I, I know your heart. Your heart is good, but you can't do this. Yeah, I can't do it. No, you can't. You're David. You're not Joshua right now. Remember, you're David. And Joshua was also a mighty man. Remember, you're a mighty man. Yeah, I can't do this. And then David goes to Saul and says, Saul, listen to me. Listen to me. You have to understand something. I, I know that what you think about me, but you do not see who is in me. You don't see who is in me. And then David said, start reading from verse 34. Now talk to me from verse 34. Give him a mic. Here. Now you're talking to me. I'm Saul. Uh, and David said to Saul, your servant 
Your servant kept his father's sheep, and when there came a lion or again a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and smote it and delivered the lamb out of its mouth. And when it arose against me, it caught it by its beard and smote it and killed it. Your servant killed both the lion and the bear, and this circ uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. He has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord will be with you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Joshua. David goes like, Saul, you don't understand who I'm serving. You might see me as a little boy. But let me tell you something else. There's a giant in me. There's a champion in me. There is a king in me. You might not see it with your physical eye, but I'm telling you, I know who I am. I know that I'm being anointed by God. I know that God has chosen me for such a time as this. And I'm, told, I'm just going to give you some references. When the lamb was, was stolen by the lion and was in his mouth, I just didn't sit around and say, oh boy, the lamb being eaten by the lion. I grabbed the lion. I ripped his mouth open. I ripped the lion in pieces. And I hold him by his whiskers. I like one scripture says, I hold him by his whiskers. The lion became suddenly a kitty cat. That's all it became. Yeah. All it became suddenly became a kitty cat. I know who I am. But you know what? Before he could say that to David, he could say that to Saul. He had to turn away. He had to turn away from his brother. He had to turn away from the haters. He had to turn away from negativity. He had to turn away from people that are saying, this is not from God. This is not from God. My brothers, my sisters, I want you to learn today to turn around. I need you to learn today that you need all to start turning away from people that are coming against the will of God in your life. People are who are coming against the will of God, whatever God has called you to be. Because I'm telling you today, if you don't turn around, you will not testify of the goodness and the mercies of God that He has done in your life. Because the enemy is here to steal and kill and destroy whomsoever he can. And he's trying to take away your testimony. Because he knows by the testimony of your lips and by the blood of the Lamb, people will be set free. That's why he's stopping your testimony. That's why he's coming against your testimony. He doesn't want you to speak about your testimony. And David turned away from his brother. He says, I have a testimony to give to the king. I have a testimony about my God. I have a testimony to tell him who I am about to come against. I have a testimony to deliver from the throne of God. And you have to testify about the things that God is doing and manifesting in your life through His glory. By the way, I'm not talking about your personal gain life. I'm not talking about a testimony of getting a husband and a wife and having a car and a child and this and that and that. I'm talking about real testimonies. I'm not talking about your domestic problems. I'm talking about about kingdom problems. I'm talking about people who know how to shift the things in the atmosphere of the spiritual realm. I heard people testifying about nonsense. I heard one time a story in a testimony service. A lady says, oh, I have a testimony. And says, oh, I went to Payless back in the days when they had Payless. I don't know if they have Payless any longer or not. Oh, I went to Payless and I want bought these shoes. And the shoes were too small for my feet. And they were tight against my feet. And they were hurting me. And I went back there and I got and I and, and I gave it back to them and they returned my money. Oh glory to God. That's not testimony. That's no policy, baby. They give your money back for that. That's not testimony. We give testimony about stupidity. Keep your
your home domestic to your home domestic, but give testimony to the glory of God, of the presence of God, of the manifestation of God. Talk about the stuff that we heard this morning our sister was sharing. While I was out and out, God was doing things in my life. While I did not need, God brought COVID was around, God brought me closer to Him. God brought me into my washroom. I didn't have a prayer closet, but I had a washroom that I could kneel down and pray there. I could be there and cry out to God. I don't need much space. I just need a little space to cry out before God. That's the testimony of the Lord God. We need to learn how to testify again before the kingdom of God. I hear so much foolishness of testimonies in the church that I want to sometimes vomit it out because I heard people saying stuff that doesn't make sense. Oh, you know, this happened and that happened and that happened. It's a testimony of the Lord. And I'm asking myself, how is it that a testimony when it was all just your emotions and policies? Testimonies bring glory to Jesus' name. Because you know what? There is no way anybody questioned David's testimony. Nobody questions David's testimony here. When people question your testimony, it means it's not a testimony, it's your own ways of walking. I know it got quiet. It's not a testimony when people don't acknowledge it. Because people are saying, are you sure? Because if it was of the Lord, we would acknowledge it too. We could acknowledge our sister this morning because we know it's the Lord. Saul acknowledged David because it's the Lord. He says, go, the Lord is with you. Because you cannot come against the testimony of God. The testimony of God is just and faithful. God knew exactly what Sister Hannah needed in her life. God knew exactly that Elsa needed to talk to her because Elsa came from Saudi Arabia. Elsa came from money. Elsa came for, with her husband here. They had money. They had, she, they, they, had, they had things that we cannot even imagine. And they gave up everything for the Lord in Camp Canada. She was the one that could minister to her. That was her testimony to minister to her. God knew exactly what Hannah needs in this hour. Needed Elsa that understands her pain, understands her emotions, understands what she's going through. That she can tell her, baby, I know where you have been. I've been there before. But I can tell you, if you stick it through, you're going to win this victory. God is going to give you the, the, the power and the strength that you're going through. These are the testimonies that we need to talk about today. We need to talk about real testimonies. Real testimonies that brings glory to God. I saw a fine girl going down the road and I said, oh, that must be from the Lord. No, that was from your heart. That wasn't from the Lord. That was your desire. Oh, Lord, thank you for that boy. He's so handsome. Don't thank the Lord for that. That's the loss of your eye. Because if he was that fine, he would take care of you very finely too. <laughs> so many people get into a relationships. First they thank the Lord, then they curse the Lord. <laughs> oh my God, I don't even want to touch this issue. <laughs> Can I touch this issue? Can I touch it for a time? It's okay. We get into relationships and we say, oh, this is from the Lord. The Lord is doing this. The Lord is doing that. And the Lord is calling me to do and then, And then something happens. Oh, it's the devil, you know. It wasn't the world. You know, like, like, it's like, what happened to that fine boy that was walking, walking down the road? What happened to that beautiful girl that you saw down the road? Oh, no, that was an agent from Satan. But at the time that you saw them, said, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I just, oh, my gosh. I can't get her out of my mind. I can get out of my soul. I cannot do Oh God, this is the one. And now suddenly she becomes Satan's agent. Amen. I have to leave that alone. I have to leave that alone because we, I don't know. We are not ready for this kind of preaching in this church. But I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you the truth is the truth. We change our mind about God so quickly because of the loss of our heart. We change our mind about God so quickly because of the loss of our heart. And then we say, oh, it wasn't God. It wasn't God. Well, you know, I didn't want to say that. If, if anybody has a problem with this, go see Anne Marie later. You know, he says, I have schizophrenia. I call him bipolar, but you call him schizophrenia. It's all good, you know. 
Because I, I, but I, I do believe that our, some people, their God is so bipolar. It's not my God, it's their God. Because my God is not bipolar. My God, when he says something, he says yes and amen. And he will give you the strength to fight through it. When God gives you something, God gives you the strength to fight through it. God gave David the strength of to be a shepherd boy. And he had the strength to fight the lion and the bear. And he learned from that how to fight the giant as well. God doesn't quit on people. We quit on God. God doesn't quit on people. We quit on God. We quit on God because we want to take the easy way. We want to take the easy way because the easy way is soothing to our flesh. The easy way makes it all well. The easy way is to run away and do my will, not thy will. But heavyweights, they fight it through. Heavyweights go to hell and they still smile. Heavyweights come to, through the fight and they see, they see your smile in church. They think, oh my gosh, Amherst's life must be very good. But they did not know. She just came from some punches in the morning while she was coming to the church. Because God, she was fighting some issues at the home or with people or whatever. But when she came to the church, because she knew her Lord, she knew how to smile before the Lord. And she knew, put a smile, worship smile before God. She put a worship smile. And then didn't go and say, oh, this was the devil. She says, I praise my God. Amen. I praise my God. 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 Some people always think about my life. They say, oh, pastor's life must be so good. He's always so encouraged. He's always smiling. He's always doing. He's always out there. But you have to understand that I am just like Sister Hannah. I'm battling the fight, man. You do not know what fight I was fighting before I came this morning to church. I was fighting on phone for an hour with people. I was dealing with issues. I was going through issues. I was dealing with lies and deceptions and all sorts of things. And I was dealing with it. But I came in this morning. I said, you know what? It doesn't matter because I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my King lives. I know who I belong to. I'm going to worship Him. I don't care who lies on me, who is against me, who is for me. Because I know that thou art with me and I have not forsaken me, that I have le you left me, I know that you will go places that I will never imagine to go with you, God. I know that you're doing those things for me. I know that you're doing those things for me. I know that you're doing those things for me. People need to understand that testimonies are not about how we're just gaining. Testimonies about how we're allowing God to be God. Let God be God and let his enemies be scattered. And David goes before the Lord and then he goes before this giant in closing, final closing, <laughs> final closing. He goes before this giant and the giant looks at him and says, what am I, a dog? What am I, a dog that you send me, this little boy, to fight me? <laughs> Come on, give me a champion. And I want to call out the champions out today. I want to call every champion in this house today. Because you might hurt the enemy. You might have heard the enemy tell you that you're nothing. You're insignificant. You're not able to. What am I, just a dog? That you send me this? We had a team building ministry yesterday with our all staff at Pastor Siam's house. And then Sister Ivy was there. And I told her, I said, why don't you sing some songs, karaoke songs? She says, I cannot sing. I said, you could fool me. I hear you every Sunday singing. She says, I cannot do a solo. I said, oh, yeah, you can do solo. I know you can do solo. And then Sister Daisy cheered her up. Come on, do a Cantonese song. And she chose a song that was Cantonese Mandarin and English. Go imagine that. She did all three songs together, all three languages together. But she just needed somebody to tell her you're a champion. 
your champion. Somebody just needed to draw the champion out of her. And then people start cheering her on and say, Ivy, Ivy, Ivy. And then she grabbed the, the mic and slowly starts singing. And then she starts building herself up and continues singing it and singing and singing it. Because the champion is in her. She just did not know that she can do it. She just needed some strength. Today, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to raise up the champion out of you. I'm here to raise up the giant killer out of you. I'm here to, to declare the word of God out of you because God has called you to be a champion for his kingdom. And the champion is Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, the anointing of God that lives in you. And he wants to resurrect through you. And he wants to fight every battle in high places that was formed against you. And he is the winner of every single battle. Amen. And he's going to win every battle. But before we go into prayer... As our team is going to lead us in song, I want you to look deep on yourself and call upon the name of the Lord. Say, Lord, remind me of all the victories that you have given me through my historiosity with you, Jesus. Give me all of it. Remind me the victories that you've given me. Because, Lord, I'm about to go into a battlefield that for such a time I was born, that I'm going to take down the giant that wants to defy the name of the Lord. Because David didn't say, oh, you have defiled the army of Saul. He says, you have defiled the army of the Lord. Goliath says, aren't you the man of Saul? He says, I'm not coming here to fight for the man of Saul. I come here to fight for the army of the Lord. You're coming against the angelic host. You're coming against the holiness of God. You're coming against all those things. I'm coming here against you, and I'm coming. You come with all your gears, but I'm coming with grace, the five stones, and with the slingshot, and I don't even know how to aim. But I know the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Bible tells us that he walked with his staff and the slingshot, and he didn't just walk. He ran. We need to learn how to run, run into the battles of giants because greater is he who is in me than who is in the world. And we need to watch the Lord win the battle for us because David didn't do anything. The Bible says that he threw the five stones, represents the number of grace, towards Goliath. Hit Goliath in his head, and very enemy, the very sword that the enemy had prepared to kill him by, the very sword David used to kill him. Mm -hmm. I'm here to declare to you prophetically every word of death, every weapon that was formed against you, that was sent against you, the Lord is turning it back to the sender and the enemy and is going to cut off the hand of the head of the enemy by the very same words of darkness and evil that was built against you and your life because you do not joke around with the anointing of God Amen. neither do you joke around with his kingdom so just just call upon the Lord say Lord remind me as the team is as the team is leading us and we're going to pray in a few seconds together amen hallelujah